we have the pleasure today of of getting some perspectives from uh, from two folks. Uh, we've got uh, Yetming Chang and Ryan Bose, and we wanted to structure this in a way. Uh, Yet, as many of you know, is a professor of material science um, at MIT. Uh, has won a number of awards uh, for his incredible research, but has also sort of been a shining star among innovators in moving technologies to market. From MIT, he's been involved in, in starting four companies, American Superconductor, A123 Systems, Springleaf, uh, and most recently, 24M, which is one of our awardees here at RPE. And, um, you know, we, we paired yet for this session with, with Ryan Bose. Ryan is at 24M. Uh, he's the Vice President of Business Development, and before 24M, in thinking about this new technology, his background was in engineering systems, thinking about modeling, thinking about technologies on the system level, and, uh, and as a consultant at Photon Consulting, really doing a lot of modeling to figure out what, you know, where are the details in terms of what's going to drive new technologies. And so what we're trying to do here is bring perspectives both from a researcher who's in the lab, but parallel that with someone at a company. And as they've gone through this process of starting up 24M, uh, hopefully they'll be able to give us some perspectives on both the importance of going through this process and, and building a model for the technology and also some of the best practices and pitfalls they've seen. So it's meant to be really a, a productive and practical session. Um, I'm going to hand it over to, to Yet and Ryan and, and let them take you through some of the slides and then we should have some opportunity for discussion afterwards. Thanks so much, Yet. Okay. Thank you, Ilan. Uh, let me first ask for show of hands, how many uh, of you would consider yourselves to be still in the lab? Right? I'm still in the lab. Right? So this is mostly directed towards you. Right? And uh, this first slide here is to uh, tell you a little bit about how I sometimes spend my day. You know, I, I do scientific research, I publish, right? and I'm also involved in startup companies. Right? And uh, so currently, much of my time is spent worrying about this phase diagram in the lower left here. You know, and so this is from a paper, uh, I left off the reference, um, I'm sorry, but it, it's from uh, Trap et al. And it's on jamming of particles in granular flow. Right? So I spend a lot of time worrying about this phase diagram because it tells me when a suspension of particles will clog a pipe. Right? And that happens to be terribly relevant to the technology we're trying to develop at 24M, which is flowable high energy density suspensions, right? technology based around that. And so what I, the point of the slide is that you can, at the same time, hold thoughts about that in your mind and also what's on the right here, which is uh, where's the cost in the battery model and where's the breakdown of costs. Right? And so the basic message of our session today is to say that it's, you know, uh, all of you are smart, analytical, quantitative people, and you can hold both kinds of thoughts at the same time and that it's uh, actually uh, never too early to start thinking about costs. And what I've learned is that in going through that process of thinking about cost of technology, it often leads you to work on things that you wouldn't otherwise, and perhaps just as valuable, to lead you not to work on things. Right? And I'll give you an example or two of things that I've decided not to work on as a result of this exercise. Right? Okay. And, you know, uh, the other thing I should say is that I, am, I don't consider myself to be an expert in this area in, by any means. Right? But you don't have to be an expert in order to, uh, to, do, uh, to do this. Right? Uh, you don't have to be smart to be in love. Right? And uh, so I brought along, however, Ryan, who I consider much more of an expert, and he has some good war stories from other sectors of the energy business uh, to tell you about. Right? Okay, so this is an example of uh, how we were, you know, this is a cumulative experience of uh, uh, many years, uh, both working uh, with A123 as it grew over the last decade, and also uh, uh, with 24M. And so this is a battery-specific example. We'll give you some others later. What this plot shows you is dollars per kilowatt hour, and that's a common metric to many of you, you know, dollars per unit of energy stored. And this horizontal axis is the cost of three components. Right? And these are the three components that a battery cannot exist without. The anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte. 
coincidentally, they're all close enough to each other in cost that we can say, let's just assume they're all equal. Right? And so on the horizontal axis, for instance, today you might say $15 per kilogram is the cost today. Well, I made up this plot because I was interested in, you know, how much leverage do you really have on the whole technology through making lower cost active materials? Right? Uh, you know, much of the research over the past 30 years in the battery field has taken place in the electrochemistry, uh, electrochemistry side, trying to develop better materials. And much of that is still properly, I would say, focused in that direction. This was a question to ask whether or not that there was other lower hanging fruit around. Right? And so what you see is that there are two groups of lines at the bottom, and they refer to two different classes of uh, chemistries, one using lithium titanate spinel, that's the LTO, as the anode material, the other using graphite as the anode material. And the striking thing from these is that they're all at or below $100 per kilowatt hour today. Right? You compare that to the cost target set by the DOE for grid of $100 per kilowatt hour and 250 for transportation, you compare that to the EV pack cost today and that leaves left this big open question here, where is all this cost coming from? Right? And so one way to look at this is to say that today, in today's technology, if you were to give me the active material for free, right, graphite-based chemistries, the technology is still too expensive. Right? And so what it, that, it doesn't mean, however, if we dig into the details, it doesn't mean that it's not important to continue lowering active uh, materials costs. Uh, there are other reasons you, uh, to do that. For instance, uh, if you can, for the same cost, provide more energy density, double the energy density in the same mass, the same volume, you'd lower that by about a factor of two as well. But what it told us is that there was a lot of room in the middle here. In fact, the majority of the costs came from other than the active materials. And that's why we ended up at 24M focusing on uh, developing a more advanced flow battery technology. And that's what we work on today. Right? So that, that's the, the lesson that uh, came out of this. Right? So, all right. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan to uh, tell you a little bit about the PV area. And then we're going to dig into a little bit the nuts and bolts and get into some of the language. And I want to tell you that at the end, there's going to be a quiz. All right. So, okay. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Well, while I hate to pass the buck, I want to set the record straight. I'm not an expert in cost modeling either. So, yet and I are going to try to get through this here. And uh, I think the key thing is that uh, you, you just have to soldier through this and do your best. And it's, it's not so difficult to do. You start simple and move on. Um, I wanted to provide some additional motivation for why you really want to dig into to cost performance modeling. Um, and I started covering the thin film companies in the solar space back in uh, 2007. And at the end of 2008, I was asked to go and give a presentation at a thin film PV conference out in San Francisco. And I got up and put a picture up of cattle and got a lot of odd looks from the audience. And uh, by the end of the talk, the looks had kind of uh, uh, soured a bit. And really, the, the key message for the presentation was that there were a few hundred thin film companies out there, and you know, very few were likely to survive. The herd was going to thin. Right? And it wasn't a very popular message to deliver at a thin film conference. And the reason I bring this, this presentation up today is because I think there are a few important lessons that we can learn from the thin film industry that apply very well to the work we're doing in solar and, and other areas, our, the battery work that Yet and I are doing, et cetera. Right? And so the first is that the thin film companies in, in general, a lot of the companies in the solar space back in 2007, 2008, didn't truly understand the cost structure of the industry. Right? And so what was going on was there was an incumbent technology, silicon, uh, that had a lot of margin throughout the supply chain. And that meant there was a big difference between cost and price. Right? And the thin film company business models were predicated on having a low cost relative to this incumbent technology with high price and a lot of margin. Right? And so the economy collapsed at the end of 2008. Everything was in disarray. And the PV industry was hit as well. And so margin started to come out of the supply chain, uh, most importantly out of the polysilicon production, which had very high margins. Um, and so that started to, to tear away from the relative benefits of the thin film companies, companies that didn't use much silicon. Um, the second point I'd make about this example is that the thin film companies, I was in and out of many companies uh, in due diligence assignments, uh, strategic management, like consulting gigs, uh, data provision, et cetera. And what I found consistently was 
that there was often a vision for where the cost was going to be, but there wasn't a lot of depth. And it's not that people weren't smart or hardworking, but it just wasn't seen as a, a real important area of emphasis. It was, it was more about what was going on in the lab. And um, the third related point was that the companies didn't have a clear projection from where they were in the lab to what the business was going to be in five years. And so they hadn't projected out, they hadn't played the movie in terms of the cost structure and the manufacturing infrastructure that was going to be built and thought about how they could change their development work today with that future vision in mind. So I think a lot of the thin film companies, uh, whether they're still in the herd or not, you know, are living and dying by cost structures. And a key piece of understanding that is the cost model. So what Yet and I are going to try to do today is, is help you be more fluent in the concepts and mechanics of cost modeling. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the pitfalls we see uh, that are associated with not using a cost model, with not understanding really what's going on behind the scenes. And then a little bit of the how-to on how to build a cost model. Um, what I'd say is nothing in our presentation is revolutionary in any way. This is all simple stuff. You'll probably look at each slide and think, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. I know how to do it. But the key is actually getting out and doing it and investing precious resources in an early stage company into these types of efforts. Okay, so I wanted to cover just a little bit on cost structure. Um, all right, so you've got price minus cost. Cost of goods sold is gross margin. All right, in the energy business, we're basically producing commodities. So we're going to produce a solar panel that at the end of the day generates electricity. 24M is attempting to store electricity. Right, these are pretty commoditized types of functions. Um, and so for the most part, market's going to set our price. We don't get to pick a whole lot. And some people argue there's differentiation, there's some, but for the most part, I'd argue that it's a commoditized industry. Um, we do control our costs, right? And so the key components of costs, you, you can break it down multiple ways, but you can think about material costs, depreciation, which is related to the investment in your facilities, uh, labor to produce your widget or your product, and then other costs like uh, uh, um, servicing the factory, buying spare parts, et cetera, right? So really simple concepts, but really important. Uh, one other thing I'd note on this is that uh, a lot of times you talk to an early stage company and when they're talking about cost, they're talking about materials and then you realize that actually the conversation's about the bill of materials and adding the parts up that are going to the widget, right? And that's a component of cost, but it doesn't even add up to the materials cost. And materials cost is going to be affected by yield, for example. So if off the end of your production line, one out of two products is, is scrap, it's going in a dumpster, your materials costs are going to be twice that bill of materials. Right? And so the real world factors that are really going to impact your technology as you move through these difficult first three years going from the lab out to scale. I wanted to talk a little bit more about depreciation and just the connection between that and the investments. This is really important for startups. Um, so this is a simple example, and you can see on the left, uh, the, the energy business tends to be intensive, right? So think solar, solar panel factory, solar cell factory, or battery production facility. You're talking big money. So in this example, you make a $250 million investment, right? That turns into an annual depreciation charge, right? This example is simple. It's a 10-year straight line depreciation. So you divide that, that 250 by 10, you get 25 million. And then that $25 million goes across the products you produce. So if you produce one product, your depreciation charge on that product is $25 million, right? That's an extreme. If you produce 25 million, as in this example, you've got a dollar and that flows into COGS, right? So Ultimately, you're thinking about the cost structure of the product, the cog structure. But as a startup or an early stage company, certainly for 24M, we think a lot about that upfront investment. And it's really hard to go to a pitch with the VC that says we need half a billion dollars to grow this business. And so you have to think a lot about that in early stages and make development decisions that are going to influence that capex. Right. Yeah. I'm just going to jump in for a second here and say that so you know, you know, 10 years ago, I didn't know what cogs meant. Cogs, cost of goods sold, right? key term. It's going to be in the quiz at the end. <laughs> Cogs. And the other thing I didn't know was, how do you deal with equipment costs? And then I figured out uh, that there was this line called depreciation. The word depreciation doesn't sound like equipment at all, but that's where equipment goes. Right? So you, you handle equipment in a cost model by calling it depreciation and figuring out how long that equipment is going to last. Right? So, that's, that's where I was, and now I, understand, and now I know what COGS is, and I know what the depreciation is. And 
the, the other word that uh, Ryan threw in there was bomb, right? And so we'll talk about that more later, right? Yeah, sure. Yep. Very good. Thank you, yeah. So uh, just a note here on, on integrating cost and performance models. When, when we're talking about cost models, we're just in, we're implying cost and performance, but I wanted to be explicit about that, right? A performance model on its own has value. A cost model on its own has some value, but really it's the integration of the two. That's where you get to the value of the company, right? You're trying to hopefully maximize the value of your technology. Right? And so you can think about value as being benefit at cost. Right? And so the performance model typically describes the benefit and you know, the cost model cost, right? So this is a simple example. You can think about two products, of two batteries, two different material systems. You look at the cost of the underlying battery and you know, maybe material A is cheaper. You look at the performance aspects. And in this example, you've got uh, three times the life of material B and you look at the dollars per kilowatt hour, which is a key metric in energy storage and B comes out ahead, right? So it's just, it's important to think about the models that back those two pieces of information and having that all come together uh, in, a, in a clean way, in a way that you believe and you're willing to make business decisions based on. So we want to hit a few of the pitfalls now. Uh, the challenges we see without having this, this model, and it's, it's the model and the understanding and the common vision you build in the company, not so much just you know, living uh, just with this model and inside the model. It's really what you do in your company with the model. Right? So you may wind up attacking the wrong problem if you don't understand the cost structure. Um, uh, you, you know, you've got to understand what's important and what's not, and hopefully focus on what's important. You may un misunderstand the state of the art in the industry and the trajectory. Right? Uh, if, you're, if you're looking at cost today with the incumbent technology, you want to be pretty sure that that technology is not advancing and that costs aren't coming down. Right? In the solar industry, people were looking at crystal and silicon saying, wow, this is, this is kind of a boring thing. It's pretty stable. Right? But silicon was marching on and becoming tens of billions of dollars in revenue, which attracted a lot of investment all across the supply chain. And that's really difficult to beat when you're a, a thin film company inventing your own process and products and have to explain your product to the end market. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, the, the truth be told, the crystal and silicon uh, side of the industry has made steady progress year over year over year in terms of cost reduction and performance improvement. And so you've got to take that into account when you think about your technology and where it's going to be three to five years from now. The companies will sometimes idealize system costs. So if you have a new, an idea for a new cell, and maybe you're thinking about that solar cell and thinking, uh, man, we've got a 10% cost advantage at the cell level, but you really need to make sure that you're putting that back into the broader system, into the module, or more importantly, into the entire system, the balance of systems, uh, and looking at levelized cost of electricity. Um, also in manufacturing, uh, when you're thinking about your idea in the early stages, you may tend to gloss over things like yield or utilization, and they're really big factors, right? Yield and utilization are key drivers uh, in the battery industry right now, and certainly we're in solar uh, five years ago. And then you can also, without having the, the understanding of these, these models, you can be blinded to sensitivities that lie behind. So um, I gave the example of the, uh, the margin being pulled out of the silicon supply chain, right? There were companies that had models of the supply chain and could show you where there was 80% gross margin, where there was 20% gross margin, and how that may play out. Um, but not everyone was looking at it. And the same thing goes inside your own company and looking at your ideas and understanding the drivers and knobs and how to turn them. All right, so here's an example from the Argonne Backpack model. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. This is freely available. Um, this is the capital expenditure for a manufacturing plant uh, that comes out of that, the default model. And we just we created a Pareto chart. And so if you, if you believe that the capex for a battery production facility is important, which we do, uh, you, you want to make sure that you're focusing towards the left side, right? What are the big, big drivers in that plant? And how do, you, how do you get around those or change them in a significant way? It's not to say you, can't, you couldn't wind up at the right side of this curve, but you certainly want, to, want the purpose, main purpose of your business to be addressing one of these smaller cost factors. All right, so I mentioned uh, understanding or misunderstanding the trajectory of the sector. Right? This is what analysts do all the time. They put together a report. Uh, it's a five-year forecast for the industry. They sell it to you for three grand, and you flip through it and kind of don't trust it maybe. But uh, there's some really good information in those reports. Um, and the key thing is just to make sure you're playing that movie out. What happens? Right? And a common trend is price is going to come down and approach cost. So if you're looking at an industry that today you say, wow, this is exciting. This is 60%, 80% gross margin. You know, it's most likely not going to be that in five years because it's going to attract competitors. So you've got to plan for that. And a piece of that planning is laying your own business 
in over the price and cost that you expect to see in the industry, right? So where are you going to be? And being realistic about that, you know, starting a production plant, uh, you're likely going to have high costs, you know, higher than your competitors' costs, and most likely when you start, higher than the, the price in the market. So you need a business plan that's built for that, and you've got to be realistic. And, uh, you know, there may be real benefits out there a few years, but you've got to have a plan that can fund that gap. All right, and just a, a little more depth on that last point. Um, you know, typically you're in an early stage, you're thinking about your idea, maybe you've done some projections, and this is like a stylized battery example. So say you, say you think that the industry is going to be at $300 a kilowatt hour for packs uh, five years from now. And you've got a business idea, a technology that you think you could turn into a business, and it's going to produce a pack at $200 a kilowatt hour, right? And so you, you, you do the technology development, eventually you get a pilot or some sort of line in place, and you operate that line, and you're one, and, and the price or the cost is like, you know, say 2x the price, right? You've got low yields. You, you can't run the factory uh, as often as you like because you've got challenges with the equipment, or uh, it, maybe you don't have the orders, right? So that investment's sitting there, and that's expensive. Yield may not be quite right. And you work hard, and this, this comes down. It heads in the right direction, but this is the type of thing that happens over the course of years, not months. Um, and I certainly saw that play out in the thin film space with some of the initial optimism versus how that's played out. It's just, it's a really challenging thing to do. It's not to say it can't be done, but you need to plan for that. And then the last point is about sensitivities and, and understanding them, making sure you don't misunderstand the sensitivities. Right? And a, a model here it helps a lot. So you want to understand the key knobs and then start turning those knobs and then think about which knobs you control and which knobs you don't control. Right, so in the case of the thin film, this is a, this is a fuel cell example, I'm sorry, um, with a tornado plot that represents the sensitivities. And so you know, regardless of how you do the representation, this gives you an idea that power density is pretty important here. Right? Uh, to give a second example from the, the thin film space, um, there, were, there were the sensitivities internal to the companies, right? So things like uh, manufacturing line performance and sort of the efficiency that, that came off that line. And then there were, there were uncontrollable factors like the price of polysilicon, right? But people weren't turning those knobs and, and, and gearing these investments towards them. So now Yet's going to talk a little bit about how to get started. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ryan. Yep. Actually, let me just back up once more. Uh, just back this one again. Uh, so this torna so-called tornado plot, another term for uh, our glossary. Uh, so some of you, are, I'm sure, are familiar with, are in the fuel cell space. So you look at the top bar there, and at one end is 546, the other end is 1411. So that's a, sort of a range of power densities that might be accessible. And what this tel plot tells you is that you can do more to drive down costs by increasing power density than almost anything else you can do. Right? And after that is the platinum loading that you end up using, and then something that's out of your control, which is the platinum cost. Right? So that's the... Uh, that's the uh, specific focus of this particular plot. Okay, um, let's see how to get started, right? So first of all, back the envelope is actually fine, right? When you, uh, when uh, in each of the cases where I was involved in a startup, uh, I would say that our cost model is very much back the envelope when we first went to see the VCs for the first time, right? And uh, it's, in fact, uh, one of the things that VCs love to do is to participate in that process of developing the cost model and, and, and the plan. Right. Um, and uh, so you can see all, uh, all the list of items here, but let me, uh, let me just kind of go through what we, um, uh, uh, what we think, uh, where you can get the kind of information. And at the end, the idea is that, yes, you can do this too. It's not as uh, bad as it sounds, and that uh, you, uh, you can get the basics uh, pretty much right uh, with a few simple principles. Okay, this happens to be a consulting report. It's the uh, Boston Consulting Group report on automotive batteries back in the year 2009. Right? So this is actually very useful. I, uh, you know, this is back in 2009, and the cost, you can see it up there, $1,100 per kilowatt hour. Right? So a couple of different points. One is, here is a report that someone has spent you know, many person days on in order to collect all this information, and broken it down into all the different cost categories, for instance, components. And back then, because of the high cost of the pack, the dark green bar at the bottom, active materials, was even a smaller slice. Right? I didn't pay that close attention to this at the time, and I should have. Right? Right? So this is consistent with what I showed you earlier. 
Uh, the second thing is that this is back in 2009, and so if you had said, I have technology that will hit the market in five years and be at half that cost, so I'll be at 600, and that's going to be great, and the rest will all be gross margin. Right? Well, that would not have been true because the cost from then to now has already dropped in half. Right? And so this goes to Ryan's point of projecting out, where do you think the industry will be in a, in a few years? And, in fact, the trajectory uh, of the industry, this, again, emphasizing this point, that understanding where the tra trajectory is, starting w with what you're doing today, if you expect to be in the market in three, four years, where do we really expect automotive uh, pack prices to be at that point? Probably around 300, right? uh, 300 to 400 in, in that time. So, this, but the public source of information are, are, are great, right? Um, Basic model. We're going to show you a couple of different examples of basic models that we put together for our efforts, right? And the things that it allows you to do, you see some of the things here. And the sensitivity analysis is really, you know, you find out where the big costs are and what the sensitivity to the specific costs are. And that, to me, is the, the, the biggest value to get, that you can get out of it. And so here's an example of a very detailed cost model. My uh, co-founder and colleague at 24M, Craig Carter, built this graphical user interface, right? And so each one of these toggles has an extensive algorithm behind it, it turns out, right? A, a lot of it is redacted, but it counts for almost everything in the system, right? And so, for example, uh, what determines power? What determines the stack, tank, just a flow battery, right? Um, what is the cathode we're using? What is the anode we're using? What is the membrane cost? Everything is in here, right? And I want to point out, we have one particular slider at the top. It's called margin, right? And this is the one, this is what keeps uh, our CEO interested, right? He likes to slide that margin bar back and forth and see what the impact is, right? Okay. But this is an example of something that is custom made for our product or our business. And you see that the numbers that come out, uh, it goes from zero to $350 per kilowatt hour. I was, I was thinking that what we should have done is really uh, you know, pulled a fast one to ARPA E and expanded that scale so it only went from zero to 25. <laughs> We've gotten them all excited. <laughs> but this is, for instance, this is how we do it. Right? Let me show you an example of a public cost model. This is Kevin Gallagher's work from Argon. Right? In order to actually check our model, we then took Kevin's model, which is publicly available, right? open source, you can get it there, and then performed the number of modifications uh, on it in order to compare it against ours, and just to build more confidence that our model is correct. Right? And so this is a pie chart from Kevin's model that shows you, you know, a variety, of, well, really all of the costs involved. And so this is the so-called COGS that we referred to earlier, build materials plus labor plus depreciation plus. Right? And so uh, you, this is a, you know, uh, you don't have to build your own from scratch. Right? And when you go behind these, again, in each of these models that are already, you know, so Kevin spent uh, quite a bit of time developing this, right? Go behind it, and what's behind it? Well, here's the materials spreadsheet, and you can go in there and change things, right? What I like to do is go in there and zero out entire rows, right? And zero out another entire row. And so imagine if we didn't need that at all, right? What would it do to the, uh, to the cost? Well, in some cases, the answer is, well, it wouldn't do very much for you at all. In other cases, it's, it has a big impact, right? So this is, for instance, the materials part behind that cost model of Kevin's. This is the manufacturing part. Here again, you know, we took that model and said, okay, imagine if we didn't need this operation. Let's say, imagine if we didn't need coding at all, right? And so you can start to take out uh, rows here, and that helps, to, uh, uh, helps, uh, helps you towards your final cost model as well. And you know, similarly, well, what about battery size, right? This is already set up so that you can calculate the cost for different battery sizes. Batteries one, two, three, four, and five scale up in the capacity, right? the systematically increasing capacity. You know, what's the impact of battery size? So all of these things take a long time for you to work out on your own, but uh, in this case with a uh, available uh, a model to work from, it simplifies your task a lot. So this is an example of how uh, we've, uh, we've done it ourselves. Right? And so, um, Back to the so-called Pareto chart, right? New term, Pareto chart. And the first time I didn't know what that was either. But Pareto is, a, is an Italian researcher who originally came up with the term. And you know, Ryan had said, of course, focus on this end. This is, let me just say a little more background. This summarizes the capital cost for a battery plant 
of about 200 to 250 million dollars to produce about 1.1 gigawatt hours of battery per year. Right? Okay, um, if you look at what the DOE tech team in batteries is talking about these days, they've actually called out this particular bar down here, formation cycling. Okay? If you're new to the industry, you might say, well, why, what is that, formation cycling? We have a friend in the battery industry who refers to it as the stupid process. Right? It's stupid, it's costly, but we all have to go through it. And it's the cost of carrying out the first formation charge-discharge cycle to condition a battery and to test it before it can release it as a product. Right? And so you see that the capital cost of this is $40 million for that factory alone. Right? So if you've got a bright idea about how to get rid of this altogether, I'm sure DOE would love to see a proposal from you. Okay. All right. So that's the Pareto chart. Right? Sensitivity analysis. Right? This, you know, this, this kind of cost modeling, technical economic analysis is becoming, is the interest in it and the work that's done is increasing and the quality of the work is increasing all the time. This is a recent paper from uh, Antonio uh, Bonacici's group at MIT, and this has to do with solar. Right? This is PV. And this is an interesting plot. The, the, way they, the way they've plotted this is maximum cost savings available dollars per watt peak. Right? And this is the cost, module cost sensitivity, namely for each percent reduction in, you can read it yourself, percent reduction in cost, per percent, how much bang for the buck do you get for percent reduction in this variable? So what you find is that efficiency is still the big variable out here. 1% reduction in cost gives you 1% reduction in, uh, uh, sorry, 1% improvement in efficiency gives you 1% in cost. Right. So here's an example where a lot of the other things you might spend time working on, you can categorize the sensitivity to on this plot. Okay? All right. We're almost done here. All right. So then we go from that, and you can expand and get more detailed as necessary. And in the end, you know, where we are at this point is that we're sharing our cost model with potential investors, partners, so that they can understand and dig into the level of detail necessary to build the confidence that's necessary to partner or to invest. Right. All right. This is a quiz, but it's actually an open book quiz. Right. It's really easy. Right. These are the terms. Right. Bomb. Now, don't say B-O-M. Right. That'll uh, label you immediately as a rube who doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. That sounds like something you get from your you know, gastroenterologist or something like that. Right. So it's pronounced bomb. Right. It stands for Bill of Materials. And it's the actual cost of the materials that goes into your uh, unit, right? And then there's COGS, cost of goods sold. So if you just learn those two terms, you're gonna, you, you, you immediately your credibility with investors rises tremendously. You know what your bomb is, and you have a stab at what your COGS are. You know, you, you're, uh, it's 80% of the way there, right? And so, as you say, uh, build materials, right? COGS includes the other costs, right? Price versus cost. Huge confusion over price versus cost. Not only that, price to whom, right? So you're, if you're a battery maker, you have a cost and you have a price. The car maker who buys it from you has a cost, which is your price, and then they have their price, right? And so it's really important to identify what's uh, price versus and what's cost. Yield. You all know what yield is, right? But, you know, if your yield is 50%, your bomb just went up by a factor of two. Right. And so that's why that's important. Utilization. Your, your factory is designed to produce a certain capacity. And when you're under production capacity, then this is where you take a hit in your cost model as well. And then finally, these two, last, the, these two terms that you'll probably see again, tornado chart, tornado chart, are just different ways of plotting sensitivity uh, and categorizing the, the cost of, uh, of different items. Right. So I think that, let's see, I think we're pretty much there. Um, let me, okay, there's a summary. Well, maybe umpteen zillion was too general a cost estimate. <laughs> okay, I think that what we'd like to do at this point is, um, we're pretty much out of time, but we'd like to answer any questions that you might have. Right? Uh, we've said any, uh, raised any uh, points that are unclear. Uh, Ryan and I will do our best to answer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. 
Okay. The question was to explain in a nutshell how our flow battery works, uh, not the cost of it. <laughs> how does it work? Okay. Um, some of you may know how a flow battery works. A flow battery has a, a stack that generates power, and you circulate a, flow, a fluid electrode, uh, and that is the, the energy stored in the electrode, the power is extracted through the stack. Right? Our basic concept is that we would like to take that architecture, increase the energy density of the flowing electrodes by over an order of magnitude. Right? And in the process, what our cost model shows us is that it drives down the cost enormously. Right? Because energy density, low energy density in a flow battery system translates to more physical plant, more pumps, more tanks, more hardware. Right? And so the way we are uh, approaching that is to store the energy not in solutions but in suspensions because the solid form has much higher energy density storage, much higher capacity per unit volume, per unit mass than does the solution. Oh. Yeah, the question was about the architecture. Yes, you imagine, uh, so uh, there are a couple of different architectures to flow batteries, either two tank designs where you circulate continuously and raise the state of charge of the two tanks, four tank designs where you start with two tanks and have two receptacle tanks. Right. So you can actually do it a couple of different ways. That's right. Okay. Okay. So Ilan asks, you know, when you're actually in the lab doing your research, what's the right level of cost model to be thinking about, right? Well, I think the, what's been the most valuable to me uh, personally has been not pursuing uh, the things that won't have as big an impact. So, for instance, there have been a number of ideas for lower cost, for reducing cost of active materials that I haven't pursued just because I realized that the, you know, the end game was not going to be as impactful as I thought it would be. Uh, what I've, so at this point, you know, I'm, uh, I think that un, the most important thing for me is uh, knowing where the trajectory is and being able to do, oops, bomb and cogs, right? Uh, bomb and cogs to a point where you can see that uh, there is a significant benefit over where you expect the existing technology to be uh, some years from now, right? So, and, and I think that, you know, and do I do it all by myself? No, actually, I'd love to find people to help me with it. <laughs> and uh, especially if you're at a university where there's a business school around, you know, this is something that uh, getting uh, business students involved with is, is really, a, it's, a, it's a great way to work with them. Yeah. yeah. The question is, if you have a, a developing something new, a, a brand new technology, how do you build the cost model around it, right? Well, so um, in our case, we approach it from two different directions, right? Uh, there were no open models for flow battery cost models, right? Uh, I actually, we, uh, we did our own from the ground on up, and then we took an existing lithium ion battery model and modified it, right? So we kind of did it from both directions. And actually, the first thing I did was that I had a, again, uh, took advantage of uh, student help. And I had a master's student who did a thesis on flow batteries, part of which was a an, uh, cost analysis. Okay. And that actually got, got the ball rolling. And uh, we learned a lot through that. And then later on, uh, refined that uh, as, uh, as, as we went along. Okay. Uh, it took the student one month. Okay. Very cheap. <laughs> to, to give you an idea, 24M has spent somewhere on the order of six to 12 effort months on internal cost modeling. So a pretty, pretty significant effort. Uh, we view it as very important. But all that was post-Series A. Yeah. Right? Pre-Series A took me one month work uh, uh, free of charge from a student who oh, we, we did later pay him for some additional work. <laughs> Yeah. 
That's a good, very good question. So a brand, new, uh, uh, a brand new product, cost is easier to evaluate than price, right? I think one of the unfortunate things about the, uh, this whole energy area is that I think that you have to accept that successful products are in a commoditized market. Right? And so, um, you know, we all dream of being able to charge five times as much as anyone else because our stuff is so great that people will pay anything. Right? But I think that anything that scales to the kind of scale that we're talking about for energy, you just have to, you know, you have to accept that it's going to be at a commodity price point, which is why we can compare all the different grid storage technologies on an equal basis of dollars per kilowatt hour. Right? So that's why I think that still it's the important point is to, to, to have a, a window into where the whole industry is headed in the future. Okay. Okay. So I, I think we're just out of time. I wanted to um, graciously thank uh, Yet and Ryan for sharing their experience with us. I th these guys are pretty humble, you know, saying you know, they're not experts in this field. But as far as what we're talking about here, you know, these guys have done it as well as anyone. And, and of our projects, we've been really impressed by, by their effort on the modeling and having that drive the R&D. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.